story. All right, I'm going to start us off with a story. So I was I was flying into Charlotte, North Carolina for um, some work at a client. And there was some delays. And next, you know, it's like 9 o'clock p.m. And I'm in the parking garage in a long line waiting for my rental car. And like I do most nights, I'm on my ear um, talking to somebody as I'm waiting in line. And I just so happen to be talking about some of the things that I have going on. And all of a sudden, the, they said, hey, we have some um, electric cars. Does anybody want an electric car? And I said, I'm tired of being in line. Yes, I'll take one. I'll take one. But this earbud said to me, your, your, your bud, Tess, we can't hear you anymore. Is that part of your story? <laughs> I was thinking the same thing. I thought the earbud went out. Okay. All right. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Yep. You can't. So we heard up to. So I guess have what? This I'm going to be using the earbud. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I can hear you now. So okay. my friend says to me, the person on the other line says to me, Tess, do you know if your hotel has an electric? has a charger for your car? I'm like, I don't know. She said, do you know if the client site has a charger for your car? I said, I don't know. She said, Tess, don't do it. Get back in line and go get a regular car. <laughs> she do that because I might have a dead car, right? I can't charge it. And then I'm not going to get on the client site and deliver the value they've been, I've been hired to deliver. Who do you think this person was in my earbud? What, Elon what Musk. No. or accountability in the agile world do you think this person was? It's my scrum master. <laughs> owner of my team in my ear is the, it was the scrum master that night. That is what she does all the time. She's always looking out for impediments. She is invaluable to our team um, and helping us deliver because she is looking ahead and clearing things before they become a problem. And that's exactly what this role of a scrum master is all about. So we've seen a trend in the last two years. So it used to be for many years, the scrum master position was the 10th most sought after position in the United States. Like when you looked at Indeed or you looked at any of these job websites or something, what are they always looking for? They're always looking for scrum masters. Companies could not hire enough scrum masters. Um, so it would, it would get warm bodies to just fill this role as a scrum master. But now the last two years, as the economy has been, you know, inflation's been going up, it's been hard to get you know, some people to come back to work um, and companies need to tighten their belts a little bit. And one of the things that we've noticed is they're starting to lay off scrum masters. And I'm, I can't help but feel responsible because I've trained so many and certified so many of the scrum masters out there in the market. I feel really bad that this is happening. So I want to help fix this problem. And I think a big part of the problem is, I think there's a plethora of reasons. But one of the big ones is that they're not being empowered in organizations. So they end up just facilitating or they don't really know what they can do with their with their sets of accountability and clearing impediments and how to really be that leader that serves. They're still thinking about servant leadership instead of a leader that serves, a leader that pairs with the product owner to make sure the team is delivering amazingly. In fact, sometimes now I've been calling it, they are meant to be the local COO. You know, a scrum team is supposed to be kind of an autonomous kind of run as it own little company with its own own budget and its own scope and its own, if you will, PL to some degree. But the intent is the small little in company. Now, granted, that's not what really happens, but the intent is that way, which meant the product owner is more like the CEO and the scrum master is more about the COO. So I call them the local CEO. They're about the operational efficiency of the team and mm. the system. And that's the big skill set I think I would need to really grow in scrum masters is that system thinking and being able to be make um organizations more operationally efficient that's where their value is that's what they're hired for that's what they're meant to do and that will keep their jobs so 
Um, our call out here tonight is just to see if anyone is interested in a separate meetup where we focus specifically on skills um, for that scrum master role, those accountabilities around operational efficiency and system theory and thinking. Um, and some of what we what we're teaching today and what we're doing that's different from maybe when you were certified a few years ago, as we've tried to make this a leader that serves, not a servant leadership. So I have in the chat, I will put in here a little thing that my colleague wrote up. Uh, Brian was going to be, oh, it's not copying why. Oh, it's too long. Okay, hang on. I'm going to put a link in the chat where you can go in and say if you're interested. And if so, what topics you're interested in as well. Okay, I have a whole list in my head, but naturally, I'd rather hear specifically from you um, so that we can Im Im improve this uh, skill set out in the market and this fix, hopefully resolve this problem we're having. Because if companies are I need to tighten their belts and be more efficient. <laughs> they absolutely should be looking at more scrum masters out there. All right, thank you. Thanks, Tess. Are you gonna get? A, are you gonna hang around? And is this link gonna yes. like persist? I mean, is this something that? Yes, will... it will. It will take you to a, a a survey, a little type form survey, so you can answer some questions, mm -hmm. and then we'll collect that data, and then we can let you know what the data says and whether we take this forward or not. And, and you did put it in the chat? No, I tried. It was too long. So I will do okay. it again. Okay. Okay. So you can, I'll put it in the chat while we can move on to the next, next part of the program because I have to cut the message down. Right. Next part is introducing our speaker and talking a little bit about, you know, what we've got coming up as well. So um, we are, we, we made a, a couple little changes for um, this Agile group meetup over the course of this year we've been taking july off as just a enjoy vacation in summer you know it's lovely and then um also decided that we're going to take off december because holidays yes it makes things a little tough and um so but that's just a couple little housekeeping things and um we've got We've got topics for February and soon to be March and working on the rest of the year. So we're really excited about what we've got um, kind of teed up for the rest of the year um, so far. So keep your eye out and thank you to all the new members that joined. Even if it was just like, I want to try it. It's okay. Try it. You will like it. And we appreciate your your time and, and your questions and um, enthusiasm. And now when it comes to John, I met John probably well, at least two years ago. And it was um, kind of a, a class, but going over um, in discussion class. And I don't know, Chris, maybe maybe you remember when it was or John, you probably do. But it, it was it was a really fun two, three sessions just talking about John's book, um, the IT Leaders Handbook. So some very insightful stuff in that book. And, and so. Um, when we had this opportunity to, you know, maybe invite John to join and, and present some things, we're like, well, yeah, I support that. It took months <laughs> to get this nailed down, but it happened. I'm like very happy about that. But since then, I mean, since then, John is, is since a 2021 book, he's published at least, what, four more other books, probably more than that kind of uh, the prolific writer, but um, in, in 2022, he he wrote, um, you know, the IT leaders first days. And then, um, and then he started um, saying, well, if you want to like, be a writer, you know, here's a great way to, to start your writing career, which is really cool, too. And then a couple of other um, books since then in um, 2023, um, he's added short stories to his publishing repertoire, which is pretty cool. And, and things that are, um, you know, very much available on, on Kindle and in, in, in hard copy books um, as well. So and he's got a blog, he's got things all over the place. So I mean, he likes to write, um, he writes, he writes well, I think you'll enjoy um, his, his books. So that's really cool. Um, and, and as a result of that IT leaders um, handbook and, and knowing who John is, I thought, well, this would be kind of a cool topic. We've not ever talked about this kind of a, 
a project or implementation and use of agile methods in the past. Um, and as you probably all know, we like to switch it up. You know, sometimes we have books, sometimes we have you know, um, a number of other things, a variety of topics, because we want to appeal to a variety of people in the industry or um, not in the industry or want to be in the industry. So anyway, um, I think it's really cool what um, John has written about and what he shared and what he has to share um, with us tonight about his experience at a very large manufacturing company. And um their needs for a data warehouse. And so I think, you know, just in conversations that I've had with him, I think it's an interesting topic. And um, we just wanna say, if you have questions, you can put them in the chat, you can raise your hand, you can just say, hey, John, I have a question about this. And we'll try to moderate anything we see in, in chat um, or call in, you know, raise hands and things like that. So um, feel free, you know, this should be pretty comfortable for everyone. Um, and John, I will let you take it away. Sounds good. Thank you, Cheryl. You're Let me welcome. get my screen set up here. And uh, so you should all be able to see the title slide at this point. Yes. Um, and I have to move that out of the way because I can't see. Sorry, folks. My little video icons are sitting over on the side in our, right in front of my PowerPoint presentation piece. Well, we like the cute little puppy face, so take <laughs> time. I'm thinking, Chris, does that kind of look like your little puppy, cute puppy face? <laughs> yeah. Chris is like, what? Why? Yeah. <laughs> okay. There I, we go. I, I, apologize, I apologize yeah. for that. I hadn't figured that part out. So, all right. Um, hey, everyone. Uh, tonight, going to tell you another story. Tess told you one, um, and I'm going to tell you um, another. It's a little more pain and suffering, a little more overcoming obstacles, but uh, overall, it was a as it was a success. Uh, but most importantly, for you all here tonight, this is the short version of it. So you will not hear the painful, long version of it. So just jump right in. Uh, once upon a time, there was a manufacturing company. It had good years, it had bad years, but generally steady growth. But the growth was starting to be a little bit difficult to handle. For 10 years of ERP system data, so all the stuff that had been manufactured, everything that had been purchased, all the financials, all of the inventory management, everything, 10 years of data, and the reporting was still done by exporting CSV files, importing them into Excel, and making pivot tables. Those in the company that could create pivot tables, they were they were looked at upon in awe by everybody else. Uh, we looked at the the vendor. The vendor had a pretty crappy uh, data warehouse package, and but even in 2014, there were decent tools. So we just needed to build it. Quick side introduction, give you a little bit of background. I've uh, been around for a long time, and part of where I came from was in the application development world. I was both a developer and a business analyst. And back in those days, you went off and you gathered your requirements, made a big, long, 75, 100-page document that no one read thoroughly, and you would go off and you would write the code completely You'd build this grand cathedral, and then you would show it to the users, and they would go, it sucks. So we didn't want to do that kind of approach. I've been involved in mostly manufacturing, but I have some education and other healthcare backgrounds. But what I really want to tell you about the important introduction is that I didn't know anything about Agile. This was back in 2014. Um, I knew there was iterative. I knew that there was a, a very short feedback cycle with the users, and that I didn't have to worry about a large requirements document. This was huge. And I knew there was something called sprints. Now, I know today that Agile, Scrum, Kanban, there's all sorts of different terminology. Um, I'm using the terminology that I knew back in 2014, which was that everything was just called Agile. Hey, this is this cool new way of doing things. And every story needs heroes. So there's some names there in the bottom of the screen. Um, 
that actually did most of the work. I was management. I didn't do a lot of work uh, regarding this. Um, these are the ones that actually did the work. So I wanted to make a shout out to them. So setting the stage, we needed some way to solve some really challenging problems. Our planning department needed to be able to look at everything on the floor and be able to predict what was coming out. We had products that took several hours to make. We had products that took several months to make. Oftentimes, the work centers would be overlapped on production lines. So you couldn't just look at a set of work centers and plan that and another set of work centers and plan that. You had overlapping things and work centers that were used in all of the products. So it was really challenging to be able to predict the future, which you have to do for planning. Production department, of course, had problems. They had on-time delivery problems, quality problems, the same kinds of things that, that all of manufacturing has. They wanted to know the problems before they happened. They wanted to know where the worst problems were. So they needed better reporting on all parts of the production environment. Engineering and production needed the ability to drill down and find root cause. And if any of you have ever done true root cause analysis on things, you need a lot of data to do it. And the majority of the data that you need, you don't have. So that was a tough problem. But these were all the kinds of things that people were hoping to get out of this. Looking at our resources, we were pretty fortunate. We had uh, a good IT team that had both good database anal analyst skills and good infrastructure skills to be able to keep databases running. This helped a lot. Our ERP system was on Oracle, um, but the Oracle system for this was a little too much. Um, but a big benefit was that we knew the ERP system and the data inside it. We had people that knew the, the background, the data that was behind the ERP system, and we knew had people that knew the business. And those were two important uh, keys to, this, to, the, to our success. Because when you look at the data, data warehouse and reporting, it's you never get the same answer. Well, what is this? And especially when terminology is changing by vendors and everything like that. So there's the parable of elephant and the blind men. A blind man encounter an elephant. One of them goes to the trunk and feels it and says, oh, an elephant is like a snake. Another one touches the ear and says, no, an elephant is like a fan. Another one goes to a leg and says, no, it's like a big pillar. Another one goes to the side, feels the massive side of the elephant and says, no, this is like a wall. Another one touches the tusk and said, no, this is like a spear. If you ask 10 people what a data warehouse and reporting project is, you will get 15 different answers. This gets even more complicated when you look at the element of time. Once you start providing people with reports, once you start providing people with uh, deep analytic tools, it changes what they expect out of the system. So not only is a data warehouse and reporting project hard to define, the definition changes over time. So communicating our goal was a critical part of this and it turned out to be almost as hard as building the system itself. Now, I told you a little bit about um, my agile knowledge at that point. Um, I knew a little bit about it, but. A key thing is what was the team's prior Agile experience? Because this was important going in. None. There was no experience whatsoever. None of us had ever done any kind of Agile projects. And back in 2014, you really couldn't use a lot, learn a lot on YouTube. There wasn't a lot there to do, and there wasn't organizations like this that you could do that. Or if they were there, we didn't know about them because we weren't plugged in. Also, Agile tools, you need software tools to be able to do an effective Agile project. So what tools did we have available to us? Also none. Um, we, weren't, we didn't know what tools were out there. We had no budget to get tools. So that was another challenge we had. So with all that, how are we gonna go about doing? It? Well, we knew from our philosophy of the project that we didn't know what the company wanted. The company didn't know what the company wanted. A data warehouse and reporting project was this vague thing. So we had to have an iterative approach and Agile was the only hope out there for us that we knew about. I also knew from long practice that slow and steady wins the race. You can come out and do a, do a flash of something, get spend a couple months, get some stuff out there. 
But the real test of time is, is it still being used 10 months from now, 10 years from now? Slow and steady wins the race. If you keep doing some for a long period of time, you can accomplish a lot of different things. Looking at our timeline, we started the project in 2014. We had everything laid out um, by the summertime and we had our first print, first print in August of 2014. Woo that was a day of celebration. Then for the next seven years until I left in 2021, we had two week sprints with no breaks. We didn't miss any holidays or vacations. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. The system was huge uh, when I left, uh, presumably it still is. Almost a terabyte of data, lots and lots of models, hundreds of measures. We had reports for Excel and Power BI and ad hoc queries and all sorts of things out there. A really large system that had grown over that time. Um, for you database folks out there, a quick uh, architecture statement. We use Microsoft SQL Server, uh, three components of it that are still there, but Microsoft doesn't talk about them too much because they're all talking about data lakes and all sorts of other things. Um, but uh, this was the, the tools that we used. We had some data load problems. Um, well, not problems, but we tried to anticipate the data load problems. So when you When you create a data warehouse, you have to pull your data out of the ERP system. Your ERP system is set up as transactional. It's about people can do inventory check-in and check-out. People can schedule um, production floor. People can do all the things very fast. Well, ERP databases are terrible for reporting off, off of. So we had to pull the data into another database. That's the standard way you do it. And so we looked at if we had to pull some data from a table, if we wanted this kind of data, chances are someday we were gonna need it all. So as we set up our tasks in our agile process, we all we tried to keep a view down the road. So if we needed some data, we pulled it all. And if it was really large, cause we had records, we had some tables that were hundreds of thousands of records and we had one or two that were the, there was millions of records. And that's a, that's a tough thing to pull in. Now, our agile process. So we had our prioritized backlog and I'll talk about that a little bit, prioritization, was always a challenge. It was a challenge at the beginning. It was a challenge when I left. I presume it's, it's still a challenge. I don't think that there's any um, cut and dried way to do uh, prioritization. As I mentioned, we had two week sprints. We did our go live on Monday morning. We could push things out, um, usually without breaking. If there was something that was gonna break some things, we rolled that out on Sunday evening. We did testing, user testing and production the mechanism of moving things into production. You're scripting your database, you're moving files, um, settings, et cetera. All that stuff was in every single sprint. We got very, very good at moving things between development, test, and production. And this was a key to, to us being able to do this. Um, for those of you who have been around for a while, yes, user testing was a problem because those that were doing the user testing, they have a full-time job to do. They were planners and us wanting to test the system, that was that was a little tough. Sprint planning was always a learning experience um, and I'll cover, I'll come to that a little bit when I go into our lessons learned. So looking at our starting tools, we didn't have anything as I mentioned before. So we decided to build our own, right? And I know that's what you do when you have no money and, and you have some expertise in SharePoint, uh, which we did. Um, for those of you who don't know SharePoint, it's kind of a, for this purpose, it's a fancy Excel. Microsoft would have a heart attack if they heard you describe it that way, but for our purposes, that's what it was. Uh, for those of you who do have SharePoint experience, I'm sorry, um, but your experience is probably similar to ours. It worked, it was not pretty, and it was very limited, but it got the job done initially. And I listed analysis there, but frankly, we didn't do any analysis at all. We had we have enough trouble just tracking all of our tasks and trying to figure out what this um, this agile process was. Fortunately, a couple of years down the road, the team, which had you know, there's some turnover and, and some new people, the team had really grown to hate SharePoint uh, with a passion. Uh, one of them used the phrase "with the heat of a thousand suns," which I think was a little bit of an exaggeration, but you know. They were the ones using it, so I couldn't really object to it too much. They went out and found a replacement. They made the change without missing a sprint, and I was skeptical. 
uh, but they proved me wrong. And frankly, I love it when a team does that. Uh, we actually did add some analysis. We used Power BI where we could pull out JIRA data into our data warehouse, of course. And we mainly looked at it to, to do the age of requests. When a user would put in a request for a report or a new ad hoc ability, we would track how long it was before we got it out there. Because one of the number one things that an IT department has to do is be responsive. You cannot be slow and be an effective IT department. So we really watched that and tried to be as fast as we could. So let's kind of jump into the stuff that we learned because this is all of our fun stuff. Prioritization, as I said, it was something that was tough the whole time. So the company was originally divided up by product divisions and they each had their own priorities. A few years into this, the company reorganized into functional areas. So that changed a lot of what reporting was wanted. That changed a lot of how we had organized our reports. A lot of our reports had the divisions. You know, they wanted to see how they were doing in production across divisions. Well, now the head of production didn't care about that. They wanted to see how they were doing across everything. So we had to redo a lot of our reports. That created a lot of tasks in our sprints. Um, and if any of you has exposure to large companies, you know how the leaders of all these different groups don't always sing kumbaya together. So they would argue, they would have their own priorities. Um, it was a challenge. Interestingly, we made the most progress once we pulled together a team of well-respected individual contributors and a couple of frontline supervisors and have them be the ones that would look at prioritization because they knew more down in the details than the upper leaders did. We focused on asking the question, what decisions or actions will you take if you have this report, if you're, ability, if you're able to pull this kind of data out? And that got rid of a lot of nice to haves, uh, which was, was a good thing. So looking at the workflow, you know, we had columns, we had what, you know, was our sprint board. We didn't really know that that was the term for it, but we knew that you had to track your tasks through things. Now you have all kinds of ADO boards and uh, JIRA had nice um, boards and calendars and everything. And things are a lot nicer now. We started out with a backlist, a to-do, an envelopment, and deployed. We didn't really understand that you needed testing in there. And then when we added testing, we realized that that wasn't sufficient and we needed both internal IT testing and user testing because user testing was often when things would get bogged down. And we would miss a deployment often because of user testing not being complete. As I said before, they have, they have their jobs to do and, and that was hard. Now we did on things that were kind of new to the world, like a brand new report or a a new model that was out there that they could do some ad hoc queries in there. Sometimes we didn't wait for all the user testing went to be done. We would put it out there and let the people start playing with it. And they would let us know if there were problems. And we didn't get burned by that too much. So that was kind of useful. Now, if there was a report that was heavily used and we were making a big change to that, we didn't, we didn't just push it out. We made sure the user testing was done. But that was a that's a big problem for internal. Uh, internal projects. I talked about how we did this for at least seven years. We were able to sustain it over time. And there are two, two big points that helped us on that. One is planning ahead for holidays and vacations and for other workloads. We did ERP upgrades. We had major other application development projects going on. We had um, major configuration in the ERP that got done. We had we implemented uh, lots of other software during this time. So the people who are working on this project had lots of other things to do. So we would dial up the, the amount of work that we would do up or down, depending on what else was going on. The other piece was that we had a very low threshold for something. We had to put out something every sprint. We had to deliver something. Sometimes that was very small. Sometimes it was just a switching the columns on a report. Sometimes it was making some settings. Sometimes it was a small data thing, but we had something. And what that turned out it to be is a source of pride by the team. The team took pride in the fact that they had never missed a sprint. And that's a very powerful tool 
when you have the team feeling really good about things and never missing something. Now, I talked a little bit about the workloads and everything. Size of the tasks was another one. I'm currently working on I'm helping a company do an actual true development project using Microsoft's ADO and, and all sorts of things. And they still have the problem. We still have the problem of how do you size your tasks? This seems to be like prioritization, a constant problem that is really hard to figure out how to solve. Now, we didn't have the concept of user stories back then. So it was mostly a request for a new report or a new ability to do some some ad hoc queries that came in. But those would create a large set of tasks. We'd have data loads to do, we have models to build, et cetera. And the users didn't know and frankly didn't care that all that stuff was going on in the background. So trying to break them down into tasks that could fit inside a sprint because we, we never wanted a task to go longer than a sprint. If there was a task that we thought was gonna take a month to do, we divided it into two tasks ideally with some of the background work done first that we could push out into production. And then the second part, which would be user-facing. Sometimes a lot of it was, was not user-facing. We had some tasks that didn't come from users. For example, our data loads had to run in a very short window. Our second shift production finished shortly after midnight, sometimes a little longer if overtime was going on. And first shift started in, at 6 a.m. So we really had about a three hour window that we had to do data loads. They had to load the data, the models had to be built, all of the regular reports had to be run. And oftentimes we had to create a new task to go in and try to shorten it down to make things run more efficiently, et cetera. So those tasks came in. Again, users didn't know and didn't really care about those, but we had to somehow convince them that these needed to fit into the priority list. And I will point out that celebrating the successes and learning from your past are kind of standard things. And those should be done anytime, anywhere for any project. Um, but that really helped us out on the size of tasks uh, area for things. Finishing was another uh, important action. In the IT world, finishing is one of the most important things. Finishing always means compromises between schedule, features, and quality. That triangle, you will always have to make compromises there. Whether you like it or not, the reality is that you're going to going to have to excuse, excuse me. You will have to understand that sometimes improvements over what the users have today, even if it's an imperfect improvement, can be better than delaying for something better. If you have an ad hoc query that doesn't quite have all the data or some of the fields are not quite right, not from a data accuracy point of view, but from a, it's not in the right place or it doesn't have some things, that better situation going live with that, let people start using that data and not and avoiding the extra sprints to get it perfect. So we had to make a lot of tough calls on, is this good enough to go out there? Does it actually make the company's life better? Well, it's not perfect. It's not exactly what I wanted. Too bad. Does it actually make the life better? And that, that factored in a lot of times. Focus and finish was our mantra. Pick a sprint, pick a small number, and get them done and get it rolled into production. Now, data accuracy problems were, um, were a problem, but usually we, we pushed it live and improved on it in the next sprint. Given that we knew for a fact that tiny things, small things, we could finish in the next sprint, that, that helped us. At the beginning, the users didn't really understand or get that, but eventually they, they learned that they could start getting the data now and do useful work with it and then have things fixed up and cleaned up in the next one. And then it's, it's interesting how many things were less critical when they knew they could be fixed. But I mentioned the, the data validation thing, bugs are a problem. There's always gonna be bugs and you have to figure out how to use them. And we used two things. We said, if the user doesn't see it or it's not data related, we'll fix it in the sprint cycle. In other words, you gotta wait two weeks to get it fixed. But if it was wrong data that was actually out there, then we did break the sprint cycle and push it out there. One of the advantages of having consistent two week sprints is that we knew exactly how to push things into production. We knew how to do it without making mistakes. We need to do it without 
making sure that everything with making sure that everything um, was backward compatible. We had that process nailed down. So when we did have to work outside the sprint cycle and push something out there, we didn't make mistakes. If you only push out something new every couple months, you don't do that release cycle very often. So that was that was a benefit. So some final thoughts. So Agile is an excellent process for data reporting projects. And we were talking about before the meeting started, um, turns out that Agile is an excellent process for more than just software development. Um, I learned a number of things that before the meeting started. There's a lot to the Agile process and we didn't use all of it, but we still got a lot of benefit out of it. And that was, that was very helpful. And then the last one, which is my personal favorite, is sometimes you can do a lot if you do a little every two weeks over the long run. You can do a continuous improvement for your company. You can learn to play the guitar and even clean the basement. Yes, that's still on my list to do, but I'm doing a little bit all the time. And so with that, I am done with my presentation and we can move on to questions. Are you all still there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's oh now we just lost your audio, John. Oh, I was preemptively muted. So <laughs> sorry about that. So I got a question about just in, in general. I mean, because you people didn't really like adhere to like scrum or whatever, but it you know, you were releasing, you had sprints. Were there were there things that you also took advantage of, you know, like around um, just a daily touch point with team members or even like kind of the retrospective aspect of like at the end of the sprint, everybody get together, celebrate, you know, talk about anything that they wanted to change. Um, because there was a lot of learning obviously in seven years. And it was just curious as to like, how did that, you know, how did that, um, how did those thoughts about what needed to change actually come up and get uh, implemented? Right. Our sprint, our sprint planning meetings, those were always Monday afternoon. So it was after things went live. Um, those had a part of the beginning of what are our takeaways from the last sprint. And we 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 tried to get those out there um, and and understand those. Uh, interestingly, the the daily touch base, we did not use it at all on this project. We were a, uh, we were co we had an office, everybody was there. People mm -hmm. generally were were face to face. Um, however, I did steal that for the department itself. So actually, our department had a fifteen minute touch base um, for um, what's going on today. And it was we had one on the infrastructure side and we had one on the application side because it was they're really doing different tasks. Mm -hmm. um, but we stole that idea and used it elsewhere in the department. Not on a, it wasn't a project. It was just we did that every day for just a touch brace. And yes, donuts were involved, but not every day. Oh, cool. We had one day that was awesome. Three different people brought in donuts. So we actually did a comparison between <laughs> Cub, Holiday, and Krispy Kreme. And interestingly enough, Cub was the best. So if you ever want to know, oh. Cub has the <laughs> best donuts. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. Could add a perspective from the data team side and having agile become part of our culture or how we work and process our work and things like that. Um, you know, uh, I've been working in technology for a long, long time, more specifically in data over the past eight to 10 years. Um, recently, um, I went from having complete ownership and doing everything uh, under my own umbrella in data to working for a startup company where I was part of a data team. And that was my first real experience working with Agile and um, kind of working with a, a complete team like that. Uh, in addition, we were a completely remote team. So everyone was based all over uh, we did have times where we would connect up and get together in various states and things like that for um, a week or something like that every uh, month or two and that type of thing. So we did get some face-to-face -face interaction, but that was part of an uh, interesting thing about um, how do we do that 
uh, agile process being such a culture shift in the first place and on layered on top of that, that whole being completely remote aspect thing of it. So we did have those morning standups. Um, we also had a lot of people that did a lot of different things. So that communication was really needed because you were talking about how they have like infrastructure aspects of the team that did things. And then uh, like the analysts, the coding aspects of it, the teams there and that communication across both of those, a lot of that deployment across various environments and things like that. So we go into production without as many mistakes, hopefully. <laughs> um, but yeah, so um, learning from that experience uh, at the startup and working with that, I became much more, I work in the in the space of being a, a BI engineer and a data architect and stuff like that. So developing all the data warehousing, um, doing all that kind of good stuff, all the BI analytics, uh, visualizations and things like that. Uh, and so I was building out those environments where we had those um, uh, trying to implement those strategies around versioning our code and having integration within the teams and deployments and process of code reviews and testing and all of those different things that you were talking about uh, that were kind of key pieces to help be successful in producing a data product, right? And learning how to look at it more as a, as a data product um, and less of as like, I'm doing a, a full project and like you're talking about the requirements and I build everything out and then I get it out there <laughs> and it's been so long and nobody's really looked at it or anything like that. And you lessen that um, interactive experience, right? Between the producers of that product and the end users or consumers of that product. So that interactive piece is, is really key because even if you build really great stuff, they don't are part of that process that's less likely that they're going to adopt using that, you know. And then the other big part of it was uh, just the culture in, in, in general, um, a big shift from a uh, data department and developing data products and things like that, as well as uh, the data culture overall, too. You're talking about the individual departments and then the the positioning and power struggles and how prior how do you prioritize those things things like that but everyone has to be in a line you know um that was one of the good things and advantages that makes it a little bit easier for us to adopt all of that stuff in the startup was like we could build that culture from the beginning from the whole hiring process on it everyone's on point and say hey we're going to be a data-driven business we're going to make our business decisions on these you know pillars of you know, of, of our, our vision, our mission, our goal. And that's that's what it is. So alleviate a lot of those processes and things like that where already, when you come into a company, already are in place that you're going to have to deal with them one way or another, right? You know, so yeah. Anyways, sorry, that was my little perspective <laughs> from the lens of the data team and how the agile and everything like that is impacting us. Because it's a new thing for us too. Like you said, it's always been more of a developer application development world type thing. But like, how do we adopt that? So the sprint thing was an interesting thing too. We we found that had to make some adjustments with that, but we made them uh, opposite way. We were not so focused on everything has to be committed and done by that sprint date. We were letting that be more flow because the orchestration and what was going on and the fast iterative pace that we were doing in, in the startup company, you couldn't do that. Things changed so quickly you could never make that plan of even within that two minute two week sprint we still did two week sprints but we always said hey we can re readjust and, and flow a little bit more than just saying these 100 percent are committed and they're done or whatever in that date in that sprint so okay now i'm done sorry <laughs> so you, you started it from a position or at least presumably there's more knowledge about the agile process the scrum process there's more tools that are available i presume that those help more yeah. than they than they hurt yeah yeah i mean um you know it's even when you have the opportunity to start from the very beginning and do it there's so many pieces to do there i think it really is um really has to be a meeting of the minds to make that decision on what that path is so do I start with, um, you know, like, do I start with building the team and then the process? And then we add in the, 
uh, code versioning and managing that? Do we start doing testing next? What's going to be the most important? Where do we get the biggest bang for our buck for the next step or phase? Because it's hard to be able to say, oh, I'm going to start up everybody, st set this culture in place, set these processes in place, put all of these systems in place on day one. You can't really do that, you know what I mean? So you have to iterate into that process. But as a team, as a company, you have to decide what that path is for you, I think. Because, you know, every team is different. You have different product that you're trying to develop. You have different dynamics of the teams that you have it built and what they have the capabilities and resources to do, you know, uh, all kinds of things. So, I mean, you, you have to kind of figure that out for yourself and what you're trying to accomplish within that team and that company, I think. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So John this has been super awesome. Very helpful. I appreciate you sharing all of your experience with that. You know, that's awesome. Thank you. Oh, good. I'm glad you I'm glad you spoke up. So thank you for that, Parker. John, how did you um when you first started, because you were literally building the data warehouses. So how did you handle that as far as, you know, trying to if you were trying to kind of time box anything, you know, some of those tasks were probably pretty big. So how did you kind of deal with that? So from from the first sprint, the first couple of sprints, there wasn't anything in there that users would see or use. Mm -hmm. The we had and the and the first getting up to I said the first sprint was in August. It took mm -hmm. us six weeks to actually get enough of the infrastructure in place. Mm -hmm. The SQL servers st stood up and and all of those kinds of things. So a lot of the first tasks. Um, we're setting up the infrastructure. We're setting up things. Mm -hmm. um, and that it wasn't until probably, well, we started in August, probably October before we kind of got, we put out, we all, whenever we built a model, we would always put the ad hoc query out first so that those Excel experts could mm -hmm. go in and help verify the data for us. Yep. And I think it was a late September, early October that we got, we got our first model out there um for doing that so yeah it was a lot of setting up setting things up were in those first sprints yep i have a question i was curious being that it was such a long amount of time for an agile project how did you keep tracking long term so that because obviously you have your two-week sprints how do you prevent yourself becoming from becoming complacent and just redundant and starting to just fall into a rhythm and a pattern that no longer is really showing significant improvement and then reflecting back and ensuring that, okay, so this is over the last six months, over the last year, these are the the points in which we were able to show these improvements, these are the things that worked and didn't work and reflect on those things more so, so that you can make sure that you are continually evolving and creating these changes as you go and making sure you're not falling into a pattern and out of the agile mind frame. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question, Jessica. The, um, the fact that uh, the data warehouse reporting had so many different touch points for the company. It wasn't one application that the company was using. It was this group of people were using those reports and these kinds of things and these data ad hoc stuff. Um, there was always something more to do. What we kind of wanted to do, and Parker touched on it a little bit, is you're iteratively improving your process and you're iteratively improving the product, the thing that you're delivering. We wanted to get the process to the point where, not that you're complacent about it, but that you didn't have to think about it. We knew that the sprint planning meeting was always on Monday. We needed to have user testing in probably by the end of day, the next week, Wednesday. We, we learned those things so we didn't have to think about them as much. Um, but fortunately, our users were never satisfied. And so there was always more to do um, there was no done state that we would ever reach. Now, the looking back over time, I found that helpful to communicate to the team and to the and to users and management, hey, look how much stuff we have done. We have done all of this work and got it done because when you do the two week sprints, those are small amounts. It doesn't feel like you're getting much, especially if if you're working on a bigger task that takes a bunch of time. It's like, 
oh, I can't get this model done. You know, we had some models that would take, um, you know, we get one measure at most a week because getting the data was right. So um, it wasn't, it was, it was less about complacency and more about a feeling of not making progress because this, the things were so slow. So looking back did provide a benefit to that. Did you have leaders who asked you when it was going to be done? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> when is it going to be done? Why is it going to be done sooner? Mm -hmm. And and what you gave me is wrong. Mm -hmm. Well, it wasn't wrong because all the people that are from your team said that it was great. Mm -hmm. But there was one question that they had asked that this team couldn't answer. So it was it was bad. So no, it was, yeah, there was still, and as I said, there was a lot of work that they didn't understand because it was background work. And that was hard to hard to explain why you needed that. So we we really tried to highlight the here's a, this this set of reports went out, this set of these people are using it. This we tried to give usage stats in there too, which helped. Because mm -hmm. hey, this report's being used lots of different times. People are getting useful things. We go to them and say, hey, um when we we, we did the ERP upgrade, we um we had to touch all of our reports. And we had a suspicion that a couple of reports weren't being used. So we maybe didn't fix those right away. <laughs> and sure enough, people didn't complain about them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so a couple of them we ended up deleting. Hi, this is Palavi. Um, Sorry. <laughs> thank you. No, that's fine. That's mm -hmm. really fine. Thank you so much for the presentation. I, that was uh, some really good takeaways. I did have a question on um, scaling. And what I mean by that is, so um, obviously, <laughs> I've, I've worked in organizations almost of all sizes to have finally gathered that Agile seems to work in certain situations and break down in certain scenarios. And what I've seen mostly is it breaks down somewhere when we start to scale. So it works really well uh, in smaller teams, smaller organizations, where dis decisions can be made quickly, um, going from idea to Execution is much faster. Um, organization is much flatter. Um, <laughs> so great, right? Like we are following all the agile principles and things are humming along just fine. I mean, not all the time, but yes, for the most part. But then something happens when there are so many teams that are involved. Now we have a program increment. Now we have arts and multi-arts and then integration with arts and then portfolio management. <laughs> so something breaks down somewhere. Um, obviously people related, it's always people related problems and process necessarily. So how do you address that? Uh, or how have you addressed that in your own experience? Um, very good question. And I have to admit that I cheated and that I never had to deal with it on scale. Um, we did have, a, there were a couple of times when, you know, we get a, um, a manager that say, okay, if you brought in a dozen people, could you get this stuff done faster? Mm -hmm. And the answer was yes, but you know, that was, it was always cost came down to cost and on that for the, for our particular, particular mm -hmm. situation. But when we did think about it, we figured we could, we had, there was usually two or three people again, not working full time. So we were a small team. Um, and we used a couple of outside developers to do some of the SSRS work. And um, we kind of came to the conclusion that we could probably add a few more people on it. But after that, the technical coordination mm -hmm. of the pieces that were being released would get really complicated. And maybe Parker can add something to this because um, it sounds like he's got a little bit of a bigger team. But the it, I'm sure that your your statement about people is true in the in the much larger scale, getting into the dozens or hundreds of people. 
but our particular bottleneck we felt would hit when we hit um, just integrating the different or touching so many models and so many reports that coordinating that would be difficult. Like Mark's um, chat about, it depends is usually his go-to answer. <laughs> so true. How, how and, did you prioritize? Because in in a product like this, you've got everybody is wanting what you've got. <laughs> so you're not just taking one team and trying to satisfy their needs. You've got so many people coming at you from different directions. How did you kind of deal with that? I cheated. <laughs> um, mainly by making sure that I always understood what the CEO's biggest pain point was. Mm -hmm. And you, you bring that up and it was something that was legit. It wasn't a pet peeve or anything like that. It was a legit problem that the company had that those groups were trying to fix. But those that weren't involved in that, they had a hard time arguing against that being the top priority. Um, so we, we really tried to tie as closely to the company's problems and goals. You know, the, you know, there was a period of time when, you know, we wanted more leads and wanted to build up the funnel. So we did some things around the sales point of view. Um, that didn't eliminate by any stretch the discussion of which is more important because there was always some of that. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we ever really solved it permanently. We had stretches where it was easier than others, but lots of communication, um, you know, making sure that people understood how we thought about it. how were we deciding what was going to be at the top of the list. Yeah. And when they knew that it was based on the company and not because I talked to Bob last, that helped. Mm -hmm. Tess, did you want to talk about, um, I guess I saw you had your hand up and then you put some things in the chat. Yeah, well, I didn't know if I wanted, if if I wanted to um, an answer questions about at scale and what I thought I heard. What I thought I heard is that, um, that at scale things definitely there it adds complication but i want to make sure people understand that you can actually be at scale as long as people are in on it and i actually have some clients that work at scale at the portfolio level and at the project level they're still running waterfall so you can have these hybrids in organizations i see it quite a bit um if the portfolio is going to change frequently they want to use agile at that level but they have maybe a project that's not going to have a lot of changes and so they want to use their traditional waterfall way um, of working in that. And that's fine as well. Um, what I thought I heard, though, was something around PI planning. And then a lot changes until the next PI planning. And that is a challenge with SAFE, um, the SAFE scaling method, for sure. That's where I would recommend typically that product owners get together more frequently than just at PI planning. And do something what we often call like a meta scrum or a product owner meeting just to see how your plans are executing and what the new reality is so that you catch it more frequently than waiting until PI planning. So maybe it's once a month, maybe it's once every two weeks or once a sprint, but getting those product owners together more frequently so the plan doesn't get so out of date. Did that yeah, help? That's a, that, yeah, that's a good point. I, I think, I think what i was alluding to more is just um when you have <laughs> when you have layers within an organization um and then that leads to um centralized decision making um no matter how many times you get peers together if the decision always has to come from the top everything gets delayed so that's one of the that that was that was the point i was trying to get at is somehow um, the true agile principles fail when you have many layers. And it seems to work better when they're when the organization is flattened. But again, I'm I'm I would please, keep please track of that. Wrong. I yeah. would suggest keeping track of that decision latency is what we call it, how long it takes to make a decision through your impediment backlog. And then you can start showing transparency around how long it's taking to make decisions. And then maybe that'll help leaders to start empowering product owners or empowering their teams. 
Right. But what do you do about mindset? I think that's where it, it's not just the agile process. It is a mindset. It's a way of thinking and being and um, organizing yourself. So how do you how do you get over or how do you get past that with leaders, especially? Um, because I, I've just uh, I've seen it fail so many times. Because somehow it, it fails on the leadership level. Because somehow they want. Absolutely. I'm with you. It absolutely fails at the, I mean, a team can only go so far and so fast and they're going to hit a ceiling until they're going to hit that ceiling wherever that leadership is not on board. So, I mean, it works the best to start with the leadership and get them on board, make sure they're in before you start working with the teams. But sometimes it's grassroots and that's going to hit a floor if the leadership is still traditional thinking. Um. Yeah, and and that that takes time, but I think showing them the data is one of the best ways to do it without being able to, you know, without with having it being real quantifiable versus, um, saying like we ran into this impediment on this date and look at it, it took us four weeks to get it solved, and then yeah. sh- just sharing that in your reviews or your logs so that leadership does see where the problems are. Right. Okay. Thank you. I just a little quick question, John, about your planning horizons. I mean, did you anticipate it would be seven years or that it would be ongoing for such a long time? Or did you start out with, we can knock this thing out in two years? And I knew it would be ongoing. But if you asked me if I thought it would be going in seven years, I don't think I would have said yes. Um, and there were certainly those elsewhere in the company that well, this is just a project. You spend a couple months and I'll have all the reports I want. Yeah. You know, it shouldn't take it shouldn't yeah. take that long. So there was a little convincing of no, we're gonna set this up as a background, almost background task to our other projects mm-hmm. that's gonna be part of the daily operations of the of the um department. And that took that took some convincing. Fortunately, I was relatively new to the company, so I had a little bit of a honeymoon period. Yeah. <laughs> that's great. That's great. Well, cool. Okay. Um, Pala, did you want to ask um, your question or did you already cover that? The lack of consistent process. How does the lack of consistent process affect the overall objective or does it not? Well, certainly when there were times when we didn't put out things where they weren't seeing visible improvements for a couple of sprints, you know, we'd be doing backgrounds or doing the models, all the background work. Um, we were making progress, but it wasn't visible project, progress. Mm-hmm. And it didn't really change the objective other than when am I going to have it? How come I can't have it sooner? Et cetera. Um, but that visible, consistent process makes a difference. I'm sure the others... Parker and Tess have other comments to add to that. So, I mean, actually a lot of our processes working on that and we, we, we identify those patterns. There's a certain pattern. I know that if I want a certain metric or model to be created, I have to go through this flow to make sure that to get to this point where we're, we're able to come out with that end product or the requested end product, a new metric, for instance, or a new visual in a report, we know what that pipeline of work looks like and um, what processes and people need to be involved in that and how we can kind of set us up so there's a sequence to produce that product, right? So like, Okay, the first stage is to identify, do we have that data source already ingested into our in, into our environment? No, that has to go to a task initially for a data engineer to set up the data ingestion. Okay, the next part, we have that data. Yes, we do now. Okay, great. Now the next step is an analyst needs to create this query version of this data model so I can get this metric out of it. So we know what these different steps are and how to automate them, when they need to be automated, where to play it, put in testing, and I'll do all these things. Now you can't have that done on day one. Everyone has to be in on this whole process and things like that. But there is ways for us to automate those things and 
identify those patterns. So that can be helpful. And that also helps us uh, identify like workloads and timeframes and all of that kind of good thing too. And uh, allows us to have in the building in those systems allows us to uh, uh, create data around that. So we understand like how long each each one of these processes are taking and all these things and how how often we're committing new code in versions and things like that. We have ways to track all of that now because we put these things in place there. So those are the kind of things that were really helpful for us as we started trying to go into a really uh, iterative approach of creating data products in agile manner there. So as we scaled there, um, that that's how we were able to scale. If we if we can't put in those, uh, identify those patterns and automate some of those things and have a way that, okay, this step is done, this next one step is assigned to this other person, there's a communication that goes through the, the chain so the next person can pick things up. So those things are the key things that are really hard, that, that orchestration of work between different people and different timings and coordinating quality and checks and everything like that along the line. Uh, having all that, that's the big challenge, right? But if you have those things in place, then you can be pretty uh, efficient and, and able to like even scale developing data as a product there. Hopefully that answered the question. I don't know. Great. All right. Anyone else have any questions? Burning questions? If not, I mean we can we can wrap it up and everyone can go and enjoy the rest of their evening. Cheryl, did you want to bring up our next session? Um, you can. <laughs> <laughs> Other Cheryl. This one is you. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah, quickly. First of all, I want to say, John, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us tonight. I thought it was interesting. It was fun. Thank it was you great. very much. Yeah. Yeah. In, in February, um it's it's out there. <laughs> um, we're really kind of um excited that three years ago when we started three years of January, we actually had Esther Derby as one of our um presenters. And um, she talked about, you know, some of the things that she does around, um, you know, leadership and um, the things that we can do to influence leadership as well. And then I saw, okay, their first book came out in 2006. Um, Esther Derby and Diana Larson wrote um, this, what we all call classic, right, um, around, around, around uh, retrospectives. So Agile Retrospectives, Volume 1. Then... For the last year or so, I've been seeing all these things around, yeah, we're writing a book. And so, I, I again, of course, I, I reached out to you know, Esther and, I, and you know, um, Diana Larson, and I said, would you be interested in coming to our meetup and talking about your new book, Agile Retrospectives, basically, the second edition? And um, they, they agreed. We kind of worked things out. And and uh, Esther said, well, you really need to include David Horowitz, you know, like, he's the other author and I'm like well I don't know him <laughs> so um could you like introduce me and so anyway it is worked out she goes well he's quite delightful and I'm like well I'm sure he is so we finally got to the point where um we could kind of nail down the date and um Angie and I um had a conversation with Esther a couple weeks ago and said you know like do do you think you could do a presentation or how do you want to do that? And she goes like, we do not need more work. Okay. So <laughs> that's when Angie and I decided, well, let's make this easy. We'll just like, we'll just have the three of them as um, panel guests and we'll uh, be soliciting questions from our community to say, what would you like to ask um, Esther, Diana and David about their work with on the new book? You know, how did they decide to do this? Or when did they decide to do it? Um, what have they learned? You know, Esther just says, Cheryl, Angie, the world has changed. And, you know, definitely the world has changed. So what are those things that um, they want to share with us? What questions do you have for them? And that will be February 15th. It's a little bit later in the evening because Diana's on the West Coast and David's on the East Coast. And... 
And Esther is like solidly Midwestern. And she's like, I don't know why they would want it to be later, but I will ask. And so it's at 7 p.m. Central. And it will be a panel. Um, we do want your questions. We want to know what you want to know. And then we'll have, uh, you know, a, a bunch of questions in addition to that in case we're not overwhelmed by all your questions. But we would love to be overwhelmed by everyone's questions. So um, we'll be sending out a communication soon on that. And we hope to see you all um, next month. I think it should be pretty fabulous um, hearing from the three of them. So, right. Oh, they said it'll be fun. Do we have our March program organized yet? We have a speaker. I'm not sure the topic. So, it's it's Chris. I should ask you what is our March? We have we have other things in April, and if I could find my sticky note. Um, we've got April and May kind of like, I think I talked, we talked to Chris into something in either April or May. She's on, Chris, you're on mute. So you're yeah, and my internet connection is terrible. So I apologize if I freeze or whatever. Um, yeah, I'm doing May, I think, um, on organizational change management, if I recall correctly. Yes, I think you are. Absolutely correct. So I've, I've got the list. Um, so in April, it's Brian and possibly Tess uh, <laughs> on managing leadership. Uh, crisis May, it's demystifying OCM. What could go wrong? That might change a little yeah. bit. Perfect. We are working on uh, June right now. And as Cheryl indicated earlier, we are off in July. And then we have September confirmed as well. So we're really just working to just confirm March and the end of Q4. So we've got speakers lined up for almost the whole year. And then for those of you who uh, heard Cheryl talking about the Esther, Diana, and David panel for next month, please do submit your questions to us, even if you cannot make it, because we will record the session. So even if you're not here, we can ask your questions for you, um, and then you can watch the recording later. Thanks, Andy. Cool. You're welcome. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Thanks for attending, and thank you, John. And yes. thanks, thanks again, John. Yes. Yeah. great. <laughs> So have a good have evening. a great night. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.